Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paul Boyker. I'm the archivist here at the Moravian Archives. I'm so glad you came this afternoon. I'm also glad that we have so many people online watching uh, the presentations uh, this afternoon. I've been looking forward to this afternoon because I know this is going to be very interesting. We have three speakers for you uh, this afternoon, and I will introduce three people. I'm not going to introduce myself. I will be the third speaker, but there's another person I want to introduce. First of all, I'm going to introduce to you Stephen Arizotti. He is uh, the art conservator who uh, conserved the painting that we are talking about uh, this afternoon. Um, he is based out of Chestnut Hill um, and holds degrees from various institutions, including Winter Tour and Cooperstown. And he has done conservation work for us in the past. Several Grunewald portraits uh, were conserved by uh, Stephen, and also a, por took a portrait of Christian Renatus von Zinzendorf and a portrait of Count Zinzendorf. Our second speaker will be Heather Reinert. Heather Reinert is a graphic designer, and she holds a bachelor's degree from Wittenberg University in Ohio. Uh, you will probably know Heather's work. She has done a lot of design work for the Moravian Archives, for example, our logo, uh, the panels that we have in our exhibitions. And um, Heather will give, give us a perspective on this painting from the uh, view of a artist. And then as a third person, I will talk about how did we discover this painting? Um, but then there's one more person that I would like to introduce to you, and that's the artist, John Valentine Light. And we have his dates here up on the screen, born in Danzig when it was a German city. Today it's called Gdansk in 1700. And um, he, um, was, he grew up in Berlin and, and Dresden. He was trained as a goldsmith. Um, and in 1738, when he was in London, he met the Moravians, he joined the Moravians, then moved to Germany, and he became the painter for the Moravian church. And most of the surviving 18th century paintings uh, are paintings by Haidt. Later, Haidt came here to Bethlehem and served as a minister in different mm -hmm. congregations, but he was also always painting. And the portraits that you see here on the uh, wall uh, are all painted by uh, Haidt. Mm -hmm. And um, he is buried here in God's Acre. He died in 1780. Before I hand it over to Stephen, I want to point out that if you really like this painting and you want to make it home, there are little boxes with 10 cards, or you can buy them individually in our gift shop. So don't miss out on that. And uh, now I will hand it over to Stephen. <laughs> Always <laughs> Hello. I was thrilled to see the painting revealed on the cards. It's great. Um, anyway, uh, when Paul uh, brought me this painting, or had me come and uh, look at it. Um, it was in you know pretty dismal condition. Uh, the first thing you see, of course, is it's incredibly dark, and it's because it's covered with a lot of dirt, multiple layers of natural resin varnish, which have turned brown as they aged. And there were old repaints that previous restorations from 100 years or ago or more had happened. Um, but before I could do anything, I mean, your first impulse is, oh, I want to clean this. Well, it, it, it was not possible to do that immediately because the paint layer was very insecure. Mm -hmm. uh, this was on, a, it's on its original canvas. It had never had a supplemental layer of canvas added to the back. That original canvas was very rotted and fragile. And the paint layer was cracked and curling forward and pulling away from the canvas. So if you had tried to clean with a cotton swab, you would have been pulling up little pieces of the painting. So the first thing you need to do is structurally stabilize something when you're um, uh, starting a conservation treatment. And here, here's a, a little bit uh, closer of a, a detail and then a little bit closer yet. And uh, perhaps you can see, I'm not sure, but like right in that area there, you can see horizontal lines and the, the paint is quite cracked and curled forward. Um, so those are things that have to be addressed. So what one does is you blow it into the of stalks, capillary action pulls that adhesive behind the, the cracked paint, and then that paint layer, can you can use heat act to activate the adhesive and reattach the paint to the canvas. Once the paint is reattached to the canvas, you can then clean it, which was the next step. This is um, 
procedure that happens after cleaning. Uh, but uh, so I'll get to that in a minute. I've got the paint glue down. I'm going to clean it. I use a variety of detergents and solvents to remove the grime, remove the varnish that's turned brown, and it reveals repaints where there have been artist changes. And um, it, it, you can see in these two examples here, the nose is different. The hairline, these little wisps of hair have been covered up and they had added a lot of folds here to cover up the small damage. So someone 100 years or more ago had restored this and they had made some changes. So once the varnish was off and the grime was off, it was very obvious that those were not original, they were not the right color, they were poorly done. Those came off, there was intact original paint beneath them. Painting is all cleaned, you put a varnish layer on, and then you do the um, procedure that I gave you a sneak preview of you put it on what's called a hot table. The painting is canvas, it's tacked to a wooden stretcher. You take the canvas off the stretcher, you put it in a chamber with humidity. You allow it to absorb moisture for eight to 24 hours. Moisture gets into the paint layer and it becomes somewhat flexible. If you've ever seen old wet paint curling off a building and it's flexible, it's because it's full of moisture. So we have the paint and the canvas with moisture in them. Put the, put the painting face up on the hot table, cover it with a thin plastic membrane, tape the edges, and pull a vacuum. Vacuum pressure pushes down on the painting, and uh, you turn the table on, it heats up. So it's kind of like a steam iron, except you're not crushing it with a flat plate of metal. You're allowing the air pressure to push down. So as the table heats up, the heat, the moisture, and the pressure allow that curled up paint to relax. So you know, paint that had been all curled up and peeling off went nice and flat again, but it does this without crushing the paint texture. Then you adhere a new layer of um, canvas to the reverse using the same method of humidification flattening on the hot table with a heat sensitive adhesive. That's the, the reverse on the left. Originally, it had an inscription. Unfortunately, we had to cover it because we needed another layer of uh, canvas to just properly support the paint layer. But the new canvas is adhered with a reversible adhesive to the original canvas. That inscription is still there. It's just covered up and then retacked back on the original structure. Okay, at this point, the painting is cleaned of the repaints, cleaned of the grime and varnish. It has been revarnished. Um, one other thing that had happened, they, they had changed the color of her uh, robe. If you look on the left, it, it's much darker. The red uh, it was covered with a alizarin crimson layer, again, in the late 19th century. And it was a much more vivid, bright red originally, which has been revealed in the store. So, I mean, people weren't always combining their res restorations to just that's damage, which is what we do now. They were, they'd get a little heavy handed and they just repaint parts of the picture that they felt like changing. That, this is a picture. On the left is the actual state of the painting, clean, with the damages still showing. And on the right is when I in-painted the paint losses. So missing portions have been filled in with color to match the original. I've not painted over original. I'm just filling in what's missing by matching by eye. So we really step by step, <laughs> you push the painting back to clarify the artist's message and reveal what it is much closer to what the artist intended than it was previously. A little bit closer, and you can see that again before and after. Notice the difference in the shape of the bottom of the nose, and that's before and after. And I think that's it. Yes. So that's in you know 10 minutes the <laughs> <laughs> and I guess we're gonna get questions after we'll we'll ask questions after the, the third uh, presentation. Paul said I'm a graphic designer, but I'm also an oil painter. I've been oil painter for many years. I got my training at the Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia. So hopefully I can share a little bit of my knowledge with you. So first I want to get you squared with um Valentine Height and what his um, artistic background was. And I think Paul gave you his dates. He was born in 1700 in what is now Poland. Um, when he was two, his family moved to Berlin because his father, who was a very famous goldsmith, got a job working for the king. The reason I pulled this particular drawing of Berlin is because it was drawn by his sister. His sister, Anna Maria Haidt, was also an artist. She was a famous 
um, miniature painter in her own time. And I kind of, I like the idea that maybe she was teaching her younger um, sibling, Valentine, how to draw and paint. Um, but here you can see, we have um, we have a memoir from Valentine because he wrote it before he died. So we can step through uh, the various stages of his life. And in his memoir, he wrote that when I was 10 years old, I received the prize in the Painters Academy. Um, his father sent him to the Berlin Academy of Art um, and he was there for three years. That's the only academic training that we know that he had in art. Um, and while he was there, he got a scholarship for three years. And if he had continued to get this scholarship when he was 18, he would have um, gotten a free ride. But the king died. So the stipend ended. The stipend ended. Um, also, his father lost his job. So the family had to move. Um, they moved back to Dresden. And at that time, Valentine, in his own words, says that he helped his stepbrother for two years. We don't know what that means. I can only assume it means um, he was metalsmithing because that was the family trade. And part of an ongoing theme in Valentine's life was that he wanted to be a painter from the beginning. His father wanted him to be a goldsmith. And so he was kind of thwarted in, in trying to continue with his painting classes, but his father trained him to be a goldsmith. Now, when Valentine was around 16 or 17, he decided to take off on um, a lengthy trip around Europe. And if you could look over here, you can see all the different places he hit. I mean, he's he's a well-traveled guy in his teens. Um, and one of the, the highlights was his trip to Rome, and that's where he stayed for a while. Um, and in his own words, he said it was the Arch of Titus in Rome that was um, the most significant piece of artwork to him. And it was because um, down here at the bottom, it was it showed the fulfillment of the dear Savior's prophecy of the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem. So of all the things he saw in Rome, that's what he pointed out. Um, one of the other things he really liked in Rome was the Farnese Gallery. Um, and as you can see here, it's, it's painted similar to the, the Sistine Chapel with the frescoes on the ceiling except that these are not religious paintings. These are mythological paintings. These are stories about the loves of the different gods. But um, Valentine spoke very highly of that. Um, we know that he went to the Sistine Chapel, um, and we know that he saw the, um, the Last Judgment painted by Michelangelo. And he his comment about the Last Judgment was, it is drawn in an unusually correct way. <laughs> um, now, when he was traveling around, um, Valentine remarked that he took his sketchbook with him everywhere. And anytime he had extra time, he drew. And in a later treatise on art um, that he wrote in his later life, he also said that what an artist should always carry with him wherever he goes, a small portfolio with paper and red chalk or good lead, so that when he comes upon something special, he can immediately sketch it. If he sees something in a place where he cannot immediately sketch it, he must keep it in his mind and then put it on paper as soon as possible. So he didn't have a cell phone, so he was <laughs> walking around drawing and that's actually still a technique taught in art schools today um, for artists to learn is they tell you to go into museums and try to recreate what the masters have. So, you know, if you're lucky enough, you'll see an artist sitting in the museum trying to paint away, you know, a Vermeer. Um, so as Paul said, um, after about eight years of traveling around, Valentine decided to settle in London and be what's called a watch case chaser. And what I mean by that is it's it's metal smithing, but what Valentine did was the cover of these watches, not the internal gears. Um, but a very simple explanation is that he would take the piece of gold and from the back side he would use small instruments to punch it up so that when you flip it over, you get that embossed look on it. Um, so Valentine was, you can see where he has um a very good grasp on drawing and using fine instruments. And these, I found this online. It's hard to find um, pieces that Valentine Height did, but this one um, was sold through Sotheby's and it does have his signature on it so that we do know it's him. Mm -hmm. um, 
And the actual scene there is a mythological scene as well. It's Apollo, the sun god. Um, so we can think back and remember that um, what Valentine had seen in Rome and a lot of what he saw in Rome was classical antiquity mythology. And as Paul said, in 1740, I joined the Moravians. So now I'm going to take a little bit of a detour. Now that we've learned about Valentine Height, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how nativity paintings developed over the course of history. Um, the very first nativity that we know of, visual nativity that we know of, is a fresco in a Roman catacomb, the Ro Roman catacomb of Priscilla, and it dates to the first half of the third century. It shows Mary and baby Jesus, and there's another figure of a man standing next to them pointing a star. Um, now, historians have determined that that is not Joseph, but that is a prophet pointing to the star. So that's fulfilling the prophecy of Jesus' birth. And back in the earliest days of Christianity, um, the most important um, influence on the iconography of the nativity was the belief in the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament. So you can see it's very simple, Mary, Jesus, prophet, star. Um, the next to make an appearance is the ox and the donkey. Um, now, in the Bible's New Testament, the birth of Jesus is recorded in the Gospels, Matthew and Luke, but they provide us with relatively few details about the event. So when artists first set out to portray the, the, the nativity visually, they had to turn to other historical sources. Two of these sources were the Infancy Gospel of James and the Infancy Gospel of Matthew, which is also known as the Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew, just to be confusing. Mm -hmm. um, James is a second century document that contains some of the oldest verbal traditions that were passed down in the first generations of the church. And pseudo Matthew dates from the 17th, 7th century. And he kind of grows and expands on the original gospel of James. So these two texts, these apocryphal texts, not in the Bible, um, became really popular in in the medieval West. They were bestsellers of medieval Christianity. And these particular infancy gospels, as they're called, gave a much more detailed description of the nativity. And for instance, um, the gospel of James talks about um, the donkey and the oxen being present at the birth of Jesus. And this is the only place, this is the first place that that's mentioned. It's not in the Bible at all. Um, there, there's two significant um, bits of information I can give you about the ox and the donkey. And the one is that the early Christians saw um, one as the Gentiles and the other as the Jews. So when you see the two together, it symbolizes both the Gentiles and the Jews coming together at the birth of Jesus. It also relates to the Christian Eucharist, because the ox and the donkey, when they're feeding at the trough, um, that's supposed to be symbolic of Christians eating on the father, father of Christ's flesh. So it is symbolic of the Eucharist to have the ox and the donkey there. And you can also see that early on, the ox and the donkey were so important that even Mary and Joseph are in there. <laughs> um, and now Joseph, Joseph doesn't become a consistent part of the nativity until about the sixth century. Um, he is often pictured um, kind of off to the side with his cheek resting on his hand. Um, and based on the apocryphal book of James, Joseph is almost universally pictured as a bearded older man. So even when you see modern nativities, Joseph is usually old, bearded, Mary is young. That comes from the gospel of James which is this apocryphal text. Now, we get to Bridget of Sweden. The next big change in how the nativity was pictured came at the, towards the end of the Middle Ages, around the end of the 1400s. Um, there's a woman named St. Bridget from Sweden. Um, when she traveled to Bethlehem, and while she was at Bethlehem, she had a vision that she was present at the actual historical nativity. Um, and she 
wrote down her revelations in her biography, and these became wildly popular. They were published all across the Western world in many different languages. And this led to an even bigger change in how nativities were portrayed. Firstly, um, because Mary and Joseph are now both kneeling down and adoring Jesus. So Mary's no longer reclining. Um, they're both active participants and they're adoring the child. And also the child is now significantly more human. Human, not human, <laughs> it's human. He's less statue-like. His robes are taken off. He's naked. He's very human. Mm -hmm. um, also in Bridget's dream, um, Jesus emitted sort of a light from within. So sometimes in nativities, you'll see sort of Jesus emanating a bit of a glow around him. That comes from um, Bridget of Sweden. Uh, Bridget also talked about the shepherds in the Annunciation to the Shepherds. Um, and I just want to point out up here in the height nativity, that's what we have up there. Mm -hmm. um, so in, you know, since Bridget of Sweden, they, she, they like to portray the, um, the shepherds kind of either off to the back on the left or the right. The other thing about Bridget was that she talked about how Mary wore a mantle. And this is the first time we get the idea of anything that Mary was being clothed in. Um, and so there's a whole long story about the mantle in Bridget of Sweden that we don't have time for now. But this is the first time that we see Mary with the mantle. All right, now we're going to go back to Valentine Height. Um, Valentine Height talked a lot about um, art of the Renaissance because that's what he had seen when he was touring around. And that's what he he spoke in his treatise of specific artists that he admired and liked and who we should emulate. And so I wanted to pull some of these Renaissance artists and show you the um, nativities. And you'll see that there's a lot of commonalities in there, even though there's also a lot of differences. Um, so one of the first things I want to talk about is Mary wears blue. Ever wonder why Mary wears blue in a nativity painting? Um, there's actually a really practical reason it's because um, artists have always been in love with that color ultramarine blue. Mm -hmm. um, ultramarine was one of the earliest true blue pigments. It was derived from lapis lazuli stone. And the only place you can find lapis lazuli is in the mountains of Northern Afghanistan. Um, they had to take, they had to mine this lapis lazuli, grind it and add fillers to it and make it into a paint. So I think you get the point that it's very costly to do this. And um, early on, actually, the um, the price of using this ultramarine blue, it was actually more expensive than gold. Mm -hmm. So artists couldn't really get their hands on it unless they had um, a patron who was paying for it. So as a result, they only used blue for the holiest of the holy. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that now Mary wears blue. Um, you can see her blue here. I couldn't tell you if that's ultramarine or not. Um, no. He says no. <laughs> there were other there were other blues available, but ultramarine was sort of like the uh, the pinnacle. Mm -hmm. Now, compositionally, compositionally, um, the artists in the Renaissance loved to arrange their paintings in the shape of a pyramid. Um, a pyramid was to create a sense of balance and stability. And so I've kind of drawn a little triangle in there. You can see how, even though all the arrangements are different, they still have that sort of pyramid shape. And you can even see that um, Valentine Height followed that as well. Um, also, it's not unusual to see a reference to the crucifixion in the early nativities. I don't know if you can see this here. Mm -hmm. um, there's a crucifixion hanging in the background. <clears throat> um, and there's other very subtle ways that they show that. And I, I've read that one of the ways is the way Mary um, peels the blanket away from Jesus 
it's as if she's actually presenting him as a sacrifice to the world. So there's some really subtle clues to the crucifixion. And I also want to point out, this may be really subtle as well. I don't know if you saw this, but here we've got the cross worked into the manger. Um, one of Valentine Heights' all-time favorite artists was Carlo Baratti. And I'm not going to say a lot about him. I just wanted to show you um, how Valentine was able to pick up some of the um, images, the, the, the way he handled the painting of the straw, also the sort of the beautiful way that Mary's kind of peeling away the blanket for Jesus. So you can really see uh, how Carlo Moratti influenced him. We get to the elephant in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Who is she? <laughs> All right. So in Valentine Heights painting, I don't know if you can see it. You, you'll have to go look at the actual painting. There is actually an ox and a donkey back there. Um, we've got Mary in blue, we've got Joseph, an older man, we've got Jesus, we've got the shepherd, but then we've got that. <laughs> and Papa and I had a lot of discussion about this because, um, because it's a mystery. And I can just give you a couple clues as to, I have two options as to who I think she is. And I will let you make the decision from there. Um, the first one is that she could be Salome. Okay. Now, Salome was a popular female name in biblical times, and there are Salomes that show up in the Bible, but this is not one of them. Uh, this Salome is Mary's midwife. And the story of Salome, the midwife, shows up Back in the apocryphal text of pseudo Matthew, like we mentioned before, that's how we picked up the donkey and the ox and Jesus with the beard. So we also pick up the story of midwives being present at the nativity. Mm -hmm. um, now, according to pseudo Matthew, when Mary was ready to give birth, Joseph went out to find midwives to assist her. He found two. But by the time he returned, Mary had already given birth. So the midwives entered the cave, and the first to enter acknowledged that a miracle had occurred because a virgin had given birth and still retained her virginity. However, the second wife, and this is Salome, doubting what she heard, said, certainly I will not believe this unless indeed I verify it. So... Mary consented to a physical examination by Salome, but as Salome reached out her hand to examine Mary, her hand started dropping off as if burned by fire. Salome prayed to God for cure. An angel appeared and told her to touch the baby Jesus and her hand would be healed. So here's... Um, some paintings that include Salome and the Nativities are all from the 1400s. Um, and I don't know if you can see this in the back, but she's generally has some sort of gesture where she's calling out her hand because that's what got burned and fallen off. Um, and if you look at this young lady here, she does have a gesture that speaks to her calling out of the hand. Also, oh, and, I, and this actually this is a really early one. This is from the sixth century. And here's Salome here um, holding up her hand to touch uh, the baby Jesus for healing. Um, one source I read even said that Salome is considered to be um, the first Jew to be um, Christianized. So take that for what you will. Okay, now here's... Here's sort of another wild card. This is another painting by John Valentine Height. Um, it's the first fruits from 1747. And if you'll notice the lady down in the back that I circled, she has a very similar <laughs> appearance, same dress, same coloring, um, you know, doing something with the hands. In Valentine Height's first fruits, she's identified as a woman named Christina Gouli a Persian woman from Azerbaijan. Now I'm throwing that out there. I have no idea 
why Christina Dooley would be in there. Um, it could just be that Valentine liked to use the same characters over and over. He ran out of models. Now, the third option is one thing that I was really curious about was why this woman is dressed the way she is with um, a very unique turban. Um, she's obviously meant to stand out. So it turns out that um, in Re Renaissance religious art, turbans were a common visual sign indicating someone who came from outside Christian Europe. So it could call someone out as a Jew. It could call someone out as being from the Middle East. However, in the 1600s, the turban also became uh, iconographic shorthand for portraying exotic prophetic figures. And that brings us to Sybils. Um, now, Sybils were uh, pagan. They were female seers. They date back to the second millennium BC. Um, they are recorded in classical antiquity as being prophesiers of the future. Uh, one Sybil in particular, the Eritrean Sybil uh, from Turkey, is believed to have made extremely precise statements regarding the coming of Christ. Now, when these prophecies were fulfilled with the birth of Christ, the early Christians adopted these the ideas of symbols into their writings. So they kind of blended uh, the sacred and the profane. And the um, in the Renaissance paintings, the symbols gained as much importance as the prophets. Um, so you can see here, um, even in the churches, they carved symbols on the pew on the sides of the pews. Um, here we have a symbol. Uh, prophesying the advent of the birth of Christ. Um, one of the most famous symbols from the Sistine Chapel, um, Michelangelo painted five different symbols and intermixed them with the prophets. So we have the sacred and the profane again, um, sharing the same space. Um, this particular symbol um, on her scroll, it says there's only one God, infinite and unborn. So again, she's prophesying the birth of Christ. And this one I pulled out because I really think that she has a very similar look to her. Um, and one of the unique features of a Renaissance Sybil is that the artist wanted to portray her with sort of like a far off gaze, like she's seeing into the future. Um, so one of the things that really bothers me about this is that she's not looking at anybody, okay? She's kind of looking off into the future the way a Sybil would. Also, we've got the cross there. Is she looking at the cross? And is it a symbol of her prophesying the crucifixion? I don't know, I'm just leaving you with that. <laughs> So in conclusion, I wanted to leave you with a quote from the Moravian elders um, from when Valentine Haidt at the, uh, in 1756, he came to Bethlehem and he painted here for the rest of his life. And um, in 1762, the elders wrote down in their council meetings that when a portrait for the children is painted, for example, of his birth and passion, it should be very simple and just show the main point. <laughs> and so we do have a sample of <laughs> one of the one of the activities that he painted while he was here, and it is much more simple <laughs> and to the point. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I am going to talk about the discovery of this painting. How did where did we find this? How did we come across this? painting. Uh, it was 2020, um, the year of COVID, and uh, I have I received emails from <coughs> online auction websites, and I enter some keywords that I'm interested in, like Moravian and Zinzendorf and Bethlehem and Comenius and Nazareth, Lidit, Salem, Herrenhut, and that's how we came across this painting. 
This is the, um, the email that I got one morning in November of 2020. And then it says new for Bethlehem. So these were the results of that day for the keyword Bethlehem. And it showed a nativity. Of course, it shows a nativity. I get a lot of nativity images when you search for Bethlehem. Um, and uh, I, I saw this on my computer screen and I thought, hmm, looks Moravian. But then I thought, how can that be? And um, I put it away. Um, and um, here you see it a little better. It said religious master. Uh, so no description of, of who the artist could have been. And this is the description that someone in the Netherlands made for the auctioneer in Germany. And it's described that, um, you know, what the, where, where the, the artist could have gotten his, his inspiration from, but, <clears throat> but nothing Moravian. So I put it away and I thought that would be a great coincidence. And I looked at it again and I thought it certainly lo looks Moravian. And I spoke with other people who have looked at many height paintings and everybody said, yeah, this definitely looks like a height painting. And there, over the following days, I was comparing the painting with known work by art. I'm in no way an art historian. I can only go with what I see as a lay person. And I compared this with um, paintings that, uh, that we have uh, of height. And so if this, if this was a height, it would be very special because we discovered this in Germany. And height, yes, he worked in Germany for many years, but there are hardly any surviving biblical paintings by height. There are portraits like the portraits here. They're in the archives in Herdhut. And there's only one biblical image, and that's this one of the crucifixion, and uh, this is in Niski, Germany, and Susan is here, you might recognize it, because it's very similar to a painting that is in, in Nazareth um, of the crucifixion. This also shows that Haidt was someone who painted something, and then he repeated that uh, in, in, a, in a similar style. So on the left, you see the only surviving biblical painting by Haidt in Germany, and on the right, you see the same motif uh, on a painting here in Nazareth. So we, you already saw this painting. This is a nativity painting by Haidt that we have here. And there are, um, of course, similarities in the composition, in the way Mary is depicted at her arm and that, that yellow um, sleeve that comes out, um, the way that baby Jesus is depicted here, the straw, also, the posture of Joseph is similar, in my opinion. This is a height painting uh, that is in the State Museum of Pennsylvania, another um, nativity, um, not as well done, I would say, as the one that we purchased. But uh, you see a very similar uh, 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 composition and uh, the angels in the sky that are similar as the angels that we see here in the background. Joseph, Mary, same outfit, this, the, the, uh, um, the straw that is depicted in a similar way. This is uh, the Adoration of the Shepherds, also at the Whitfield House in Nazareth. And uh, again, when you compare this composition, uh, there, there are many uh, similarities. So it fits in his overall work. And when you put them together next to each other, it becomes uh, more obvious. Uh, here um, on the left, you see the painting that is in the State Museum. I believe that's in Harrisburg. Yeah. It's a very small painting, Paul. Is it? Yeah, yeah. I worked on it. Oh, oh, OK. It's very small. That's a nice coincidence. <laughs> Um, and here we have some enlargement of the details here. That's the sleeve of Mary and, and baby Jesus. Um, the animals in the back. The image on the left is from before treatment. So it's, it's a little hard to see um, that there are an ox and a donkey in the background. But he does a similar thing on the painting that's in, in Harrisburg. I think that's called photo bombing nowadays. <laughs> something pops out from the background. 
And you can see the painting in the gallery. So afterwards, please go and see the, the real painting. Haidt is known for his hands, uh, that he is not the best painter of hands, but sometimes he, he does, he tries a little better. I think the hands of, of Joseph are much better than Mary's hands, and Jesus' hands are just terrible here. <laughs> and here are some comparisons with other hands that Haidt painted, good ones and less good ones. Let's talk about the scene in the background, which is the... I think you call it the Annunciation to the Shepherds. You see an angel and shepherds around the campfire. I have better uh, details of that. But first of all, I want to show you that this is something that Haidt did in his known work, that he used these little windows into another scene. And here he has four, and they are arranged like they, they are in a room with other paintings. And these paintings uh, tell another story that's related to the story that's going on here. This is at the court of the English Queen in London. But in the background, um, for example, you see this person here. And uh, that's the person that you also see in the first fruit painting, the tall guy on the left. He's from Persia. He appears in this painting and how he met Zinzendorf in Riga. Um, so this is something that 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 Haidt did. Um, here we see a portrait that Haidt did of Zinzendorf with the Dannebrog Orden, and then in the background, you see a window, and that's uh, the community of Herning. So this is another confirmation. Yeah, this is something that Haidt did. These little windows, and here you have a better view of what what there is in the background. This is after treatment. Um, so you see an angel. And you see shepherds around the campfire, and they're 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 um, uh, shielding their eyes uh, because of the light of the angels. And this, for me, was the convincing part. We know that Hyde painted this scene, and that is a painting that is now in Winston Salem. And here we see that same motif, but then as its own uh, painting. And when we put these next to each other, you will see the similarities in the composition. The angel, the shepherds around the fire, the posture of the people in the picture. And when I flip the one on the right, you can see now the angels on the other side, but the shepherd on the left is in the same place. So all that combined made me realize, yes, this, this has to be a height. And I was very excited because this then what would mean this is the second height painting, a uh, biblical painting that he did in Germany and that survived. And so we bid on it and we got it and uh, now it's here. But now we will get, get to the person um, in the back. When you look at these paintings, she appears in other places as well. And I think this is the same person because of the band she has around her arm. And you can see it here. It's a little hard to see because it's a little dark here. But when you see the original, you can see that she has this band around her arm. Um, there's a woman, a young woman on the left here as well on the painting in Harrisburg. There she is. And that, that circle is around that, that band around her arm. And I think that's the way to identify um, who, who this is. Uh, on Heather's um, Sybils, there were also Sybils with a, a band around the arm or around the head. But I think another option would be, and I, I tend to go more with the first option of Salome. And that was suggested to me that it could be Salome. After I spoke about this online, we did a presentation online two years ago or so, and someone in Jerusalem saw this and sent me an email afterwards, and, and he wrote, maybe this is Salome. So I did some reading, and um, I think it's possible, because what, what is happening here and why this fits Moravian ideas is the story of Salome is a parallel story to Thomas. 
Thomas, after Jesus' resurrection, um, could not believe that Jesus was resurrected and said, until I put my hands in his wounds, I will not believe. Moravians love that idea. For Moravians, the wounds were the central point of their piety. They, those were the symbols of Jesus' death and the symbols of their salvation. So the person that touches the, the wounds is very important. And when you go to the Whitfield House, you will see a painting where you see Thomas touching the side wound of Christ. Well, Moravians also believed, and this is in the Zinzendorf time, that um, during sexual intercourse, husband and wife could experience the unification of the believer with Christ. And um, the husband symbolized Christ, and the wife symbolized the church or the individual believer. Mm -hmm. And Zinzendorf said the sisters are blessed to have the sign of Christ on their body. So the female genital was compared to the side wound of Christ. So when you have those ideas in your back, in the back of your mind, then what Salome is doing, she's touching Mary, but she, with that, she's touching the side wound of Christ. And that's why I think this is possibly an explanation of why she is in the picture. Maybe this was a painting that was uh, made for one of the sisters' houses, for a setting where women were worshipping. And um, so that's why I tend to think it's, it's, it could be a Salome. And what would be helpful is that if we find Christmas um, sermons uh, from the 1740s by Zinzendorf, where he actually talks about this. And I did some looking, but I have not find, found a text where he specifically mentions Salome. But I'll keep you informed. <laughs> This is a page from a um, family Bible owned by Hyde. After Hyde died, some of his books were given to the archives. And this is from a book that he gave to the archives and uh, or that his widow gave to the archives. And um, yes, this could have been part of the inspiration for, uh, for this painting, but he probably had a whole set of engravings and of sketches that he did during his uh, tour of Europe. Here again, they're next to each other. This is the first fruits painting that um, Heather already showed you. Thomas Mamuka, the guy from Persia that we saw in the little painting in the back. You see him here on the left. But what I want to show you with this is, this is Hyde doing the first fruits in 1747. In the 1760s, he did one here. So we know this is the same artist, and there are some years in between. Um, there's a difference in the quality of the work. And when you put these two next to each other, there is a big difference in the quality um, of the work. And um, so that this it can be Hyde. <laughs> what, what I want to say with this is that Hyde had good days and bad days. Sometimes he just spent more time on the painting, I think, than other days. So when we have other uh, nativities here that are a little bit more crude and not as executed as well, he's known to do that. There we go. So the one on the left is Hyde, and I think the one on the right is also Hyde, the difference in, in quality. And then we bid on it, we got it. Um, it was not that expensive, but then the cost started because then it had to come to Bethlehem. And um, the, the, the auction house, um, they, they built this crate and it was put on a plane and there were no passenger planes in December of, of, of 2020, but uh, there were um, planes that, that transported goods, but they were all filled up. We had to wait. And then at the end of January, our painting was flown from Frankfurt to New York, and then it was delivered here. And here you see us opening the box and uh, there it was. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming. Um, if you want to see the painting, uh, the painting is in our gallery, um, and uh, you can see the magnificent work that, that Stephen did on this, uh, on conserving this painting. Uh, we're very excited to have it here. Yeah.
Did Hyde not normally sign his painting? I know of two paintings in Heirloom that he signed. And I think all the paintings we have here are do, are not signed. I don't know how is it in Nazareth. So then I now know of three paintings, only three paintings that uh, are signed. Yeah. Hey. The provenance of the painting. Privacy regulations in Europe are very strict, and the only thing they could tell me was that this painting was formerly owned by a Roman Catholic priest and uh, a German who had served in the Vatican and had returned to Germany, to the south of Germany and had died and his family sold the painting. And that's all we know about the provenance. We don't know where he got it from. And that's, that's very unfortunate. Do we know what the initials on the back <coughs> were or stood for? Before they were coming in the C D C D V L. We we tried V for von L C D Christian David von L, but we couldn't find a match. Not within Moravian circles in the 18th century. Yeah, could have been put on any time. Do you have an idea of when that was put on? It looks quite old, but. You know, it could have been in the 18th or 19th century. I mean, I, I don't know when it would have been dated on there. Yeah. So my theory is, is that this was painted for a Moravian setting in Herrenhag or in Herrenhut. It's it's fairly large, so you can see that it was probably used in a chapel. Um, so my theory now with Salome is that probably in the chapel of the single sisters. Um, and uh, then... There was this point where Moravians didn't care for this kind of art anymore. Um, they could not relate to this anymore. They could relate to the portraits. The portraits were preserved. That's why we have so many portraits. But the biblical paintings, yeah. And then they deteriorated and or they were sold. Question in the chat apparently was about the folds in Joseph's clothes. Um, I just breezed over that. Um, when the painting was painted there were fewer folds in the sleeve above his arm um someone in the probably in the 19th century in order to cover a relatively small damage they added folds so those folds were repainted in detailed photographs and when the varnish was removed it was very clear that those folds were not original they were sitting on top of the original they were soluble in solvents that did not affect the original so as is common with paintings that have been repainted, I, you take the repaint off. And so the, the changes that happened, you know, that's one of them that happened. The folds in Joseph's garment change because originally, well, they're back the way they were originally. They're not how the 19th century person changed them. Um, and I also want to point out that, Paul, that that um, figure of Jesus that you have on the right there is strikingly similar to the face of Mary. If you look at it, the way it's painted, oh. the eyes, the nose, the wisps of hair. Um, mm -hmm. Look, look, look at the way the the eyes are painted, the wisps of hair, mm -hmm. the, the shape of the nose. It's. I think that's the clincher. <laughs> really, you know, to me, says this is the same thing. Yes, and I'm glad that you say that because, yeah, you can never be sure. But the more that to me says, oh, that's the same eye. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so, Paul, when you said, oh, I put it away, and then I checked, and, like, who do you check with to say, is this, should we go after this? I mean, people like Stephen and Heather, or your book, I mean, literally. How yes, you yes, and with, with Lainey Oswinski, she's here in the back. She she worked here. She's an art historian. I checked with Rudiger Kroger. He is was my successor in the Hermund archives, and he developed this almost obsession with Moravian art and he immediately oh yeah that's that's yeah. right yeah are there any more questions comments Diane just wanted to ask Stephen uh, how and I know it varies based on on what all you have to do but how long does the process take to do something like what you had to do with this painting um, I don't remember the number of hours but you know it was maybe it was under 200, I mean, that's a lot about that. You, you, you do what you need to do. You, 
you don't always do everything to a painting. It's, you know, uh, least intervention is, yeah, is, is what you try to do, but there was no least yeah. here to do. You had everything, all a number of types of structural work, as well as cleaning and then aesthetic reintegration.